Hello, and welcome to this Federal Society webinar call. Today, June 26, 2023, we host a post-decision courthouse steps on United States versus Hansen, which was decided just last week before by the court. My name is Kayla Kleist, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups here at the Federal Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the expert on today's call, as the Federal Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. Now, in the interest of time, I'll keep my introduction quite brief, but if you'd like to know more about our speaker, you can access this impressed full bio at FedSoc.org. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Brian Fish, who is a member of the Federal Society's Criminal Law and Procedure Practice Group Executive Committee and the president of the Baltimore Lawyers Chapter. Well, as a note to the panel before I hand it off, uh, if you have any questions, please submit them via the question and answer feature so that we'll have access to them when we get to that portion of today's webinar. With that, thank you all for being with us today. Mr. Fish, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Kayla. And uh, hello, Federalists from a uh, rather overcast and dreary Baltimore waiting for the uh, storms that they're predicting today. Um, Today's case that we're gonna be discussing for the next few minutes, United States versus Hansen, can be summed up in the old legal maxim, if something seems to be good to be true, it probably is. In this particular case, one Helen Hansen came up with something that not only was too good to be true, but was also a crime and he was prosecuted and convicted of a uh, great many things, uh, finally coming down uh, with the uh, fact that he embezzled approximately $2 million from 450 victims thereabouts from something that can never be true. His scheme was that he was going to uh, adult adopt people by United, uh, people here in violation of United States immigration law. He was going to have these people adopted by United States citizens, which he claimed to them that would lead to United States citizenship. As I stated, that's complete and utter fabrication. It's a lie, it's a fraud. There is no way that simply being adopted as an adult by a United States citizen can lead to citizenship, but that was the scheme. Again, he made almost $2 million from this scheme, and that uh, leads us to today's case with a lot of uh, jurisprudence behind it, a lot of procedural hiccups, and an intertwined Supreme Court case from a couple of years ago. So let's, let's get off the this off the bat here. He was convicted, among other things, uh, under Title VIII of the United States Supreme Court, the Immigration Act, Section 1324A1A4, which quite simply prohibits encouraging or inducing illegal immigration. Now, that's where the fight comes from that term encouraging or inducing. What does it mean? Is there one meaning that you can get from a Webster's dictionary versus a Black's Law dictionary? And that is what 50 pages or so of legal decision writing comes down to. As I said, this case is intertwined with another case. That case came out a couple, three years ago also out of the Ninth Circuit, Ninth States versus Sinning Smith. This case today, Hansen cannot be discussed without discussing Sinning Smith, such that if this was a boxing match, quite simply today's case would be Sinning Smith too. In Sinning Smith, the court took the case, I think, simply so they could slap down the Ninth Circuit for doing something yet again beyond the beyond the pale, as the Irish say. In that case, the Ninth Circuit took what was uh, a run-of-the-mill 1324 case. Uh, Snag Smith was inducing folks to stay in the United States in violation of the law. No one, either the government nor his lawyers, were arguing the overbreath doctrine. The case gets to the Ninth Circuit 
after obviously a conviction on uh, many counts, including the 1324 counts. And Synetic Smith was arguing the standard issue. They didn't prove their case, yada, yada, yada. It was a run of the mill appeal on the brief. Once it gets to oral argument time beforehand, however, the Ninth Circuit said, we want to discuss the overbreath doctrine. And since neither one of you guys are talking about it, we on our own motion are going to have Amici file, uh, we're going to appoint one to discuss the overbreath doctrine and how it applies to that particular case. The Ninth Circuit then on their own motion heard all of that and decided, yes, 1324 did violate the overbreath doctrine and they dismissed uh, those convictions. The government appeals, the Supreme Court takes the appeal and in a nine to nothing decision, uh, which was one of the last cases authored by uh, Justice Ginsburg, nine to nothing, they slapped down the Ninth Circuit in it, which was a relatively rarity, they said they abused their, excuse me, uh, uh, abused their discretion, not just was simple error, an actual abuse of discretion to do so. It violated the case and controversy doctrine and they sent it back. The Ninth Circuit with Senator Smith, then just using the arguments of, of the government and Synetic, uh dismissed their appeal and uh, the, uh, sustained the convictions. In the meantime, however, back in the ninth, Hansen can, was uh, charged with and went to trial on this exact same uh, statute. Hansen, seeing what had happened in Sonic Smith, then changes his tact and says the 1324 is overly broad, it should be dismissed. Ninth Circuit held that case in abeyance to see what the Supreme Court did in Synetic. Then, poof, oh, that one didn't work. Let's try this again. And this time we can say that it was Hansen's argument. And so therefore, the Ninth Circuit, we didn't uh, interject our own ideas into the case. That case, obviously, it was argued back in March. Decision came out on Friday in a seven to two decision authored by Justice Barrett. Well, let's put it this way, a six one one decision. Uh, Justice Thomas wrote a concurring opinion, which uh, I'll get to in a minute. His first sentence of his concurrence was, I join the court's opinion in full. So that's why it's say it's 72. As we know, uh, Justice uh, Jackson is new to the court. She was not around for the Senate Smith decision. Uh, she authored the dissent today, uh, joined by Justice Sotomayor, who essentially switched her votes. Yes, I realize that the Senate Smith was a procedural only decision but for reasons I'll get to in a few minutes, I believe it, it seems like Sotomayor has switched sides in this particular case. So just giving you folks a little background on what exactly is an overbreath challenge. It's not something that's uh, a, a common parlance. So I'll quote from the uh, majority opinion. The overbreath doctrine allows a litigant even as in this case, an undeserving one, such as Mr. Hansen, to vindicate the rights of the silenced, as well as society's broader interest in hearing them speak. In other words, what the Overbreath Doctrine says is, if a statute could both uh, apply to someone who is doing something illegally, and could apply to someone who is doing something which we would believe would be a perfectly legal thing to do, but silences that speech for fear of being prosecuted. If that goes too far, if you will, then the overbreath doctrine kicks in and we uh, as a court should uh, invalidate the statute in question. That's in a sense, or in a sum, what the overbreath doctrine comes to. Now, the, the, how much free speech 
can be or should be allowed to be chilled, if you will, before the overbreadth doctrine kicks in is, of course, something we discussed. Also, what should apply, if anything, if we're not going to apply the overbreadth doctrine to a particular case? And that simply goes to an as applied circumstance. Is this statute as applied to an individual defendant so overly uh, uh, chilling free speech as to be uh, invalidated and not do it as a, uh, uh, excuse me, at, to do it as a case in controversy and not to do it sort of as a extrajudicial or extra legislative layer that the judiciary uh, should not be able to engage in. So we're coming down to the, uh, the nitty gritty of what this case is uh, discusses. And it's really a battle of the dictionaries, if you will. Is the, uh, the statute uh, we're discussing 1324, which prohibits encouraging or inducing illegal uh, immigration or encourage and induce terms of art or should we be using the common definitions, again, found in Webster's? The majority, again, seven to two, says that the terms encourage and induce are analogous to a standard issue, solicit and facilitate uh, terminologies. And because induce, encourage and induce mean solicit, which is if you solicit a crime, you are in, so, uh, in fact committing a, the crime of solicitation. And if you're inducing someone to commit a crime or a violation of the law, then you are facilitating them, which is also a crime. Uh, both Arizona and this Montana filed briefs at various stages of this today's decision and discussing uh, the, the fact that all 50 states use the terms encourage and induce and no time whatsoever in the course of the last 200 years of jurisprudence has these terms been deemed overly broad and every single state has them. Uh, my colleague on the panel, on the, uh, uh, the group, Mark Brnovich, then the Attorney General of Arizona, uh, had a laundry list that apparently, and so did Montana in their brief, Justice Barrett uh, quotes from that laundry list of state uh, statutes that use the terms encourage and or induce in the definition of various crimes throughout the country. No one's had an issue with these until today. Uh, what were the main defense argument that is picked up by the dissent is that the history of 1324 goes back to 1880s or so. And that history involves Congress removing or replacing various words in essentially the same very short statute. And that those removed words have changed the statute such that it is now from obviously from their point of view overly broad the justice barrett in her uh, majority opinion dismisses that of uh, it over the course of approximately 20 pages it basically says no these this these uh definitions these words have been used for many, 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 many years, they have what they called, and all three uh, uh, opinions use the term old soil, meaning that they, these terms have accumulated certain meanings in the criminal law aspect, such that when Congress uses them, they're not using them uh, in as their common definitions, again, what you would find in Webster's, but is bringing all of that old soil when they're enacting a new piece of legislation, making a new law that uses old terms. 
They're bringing the old soil of all of those old uh, decisions and all of that old terminology with them when they're making a new law. And so that uh, as this, the current iteration of 1324 goes back to the 1950s, they were simply uh, removing what was were deemed extraneous in uh, redundant terms to streamline the that's all they're do, doing and uh, in anything else that by removing words that are extraneous we're somehow changing the mens rea to a particular crime in this case the uh, encouraging uh, illegals to stay in this country that's simply not the case and Justice Barrett does a, a, a bang up job, if you will, of making these points uh, well. So uh, her main point in this aspect to the case is the terms encourage and induce have a mens rea built into their meaning. Unlike what the defense and the dissent is arguing that some of the words that were excluded in the 1950 uh, change in the uh, in 1324 removed mens rea and made it overly broad. No, encourage and induce have mens rea built in, and we didn't need those extra words. That was the main point to Justice Barrett's uh, majority opinion. Uh, there didn't seem to be looking at my notes from the March. Uh, arguments uh, didn't seem to be a great deal of uh, dissent, if you will, from most of the justices at that time. Certainly, and Justice Barrett uh, finishes up her opinion by making the obvious point, but it needed to be made that speech intending to uh, an unlawful act is not protected by the First Amendment. So in other words, you can't simply say, uh, well, yeah, I was encouraging someone to do a, commit a crime, but I have First Amendment rights and any nanny poo poo on you. No, there's no First Amendment protection when you're encouraging someone to commit a violation of law. That gets us to what I perceive to be the most important part of this case and it's Justice Thomas's concurring opinion. The reason I was, I've was i been so fascinated with the interplay of Senator Smith and Hansen is I, and I think all of you as Federalists should be well aware of and agree with, sorry, I'm the expert. I'm, my opinion is courts should not be teeing up cases Litigants can do that. Lawyers can do that. Courts should not be in the business of teeing up cases for uh, to get a Supreme Court decision. What the courts should be doing is applying the law to the facts, making a decision, and moving along. That's got me to Justice Thomas's concurrence. His main point is, let's get rid of the overbreath doctrine. It's not in the Constitution. It's not in the First Amendment. It's nowhere to be seen other than this court, obviously the Supreme Court's decisions. Let's get rid of it. I, can, I tend to agree. His main uh, point and he gives us a, a history lesson, which probably most of us have not uh, been reminded of for quite some time. That, first of all, the uh, overbreadth doctrine is essentially gives federal courts the power to invalidate lawfully enacted statutes, even if there isn't a case in controversy before them which flies in the face of the point of our federal judiciary. There has to be a case in controversy to be able to have the judicial, 
uh, judiciary be able to make a ruling on something. That's just the foundational piece of, uh, of how cases get started in our system. Here, what we have is Hansen and, and Sinai Smith and a host of other folks saying, yeah, this statute obviously applies to me, but, and it applies to me because of what I did, which was clearly illegal, but because it could be uh, viewed to uh, get other people and those actions out there away from me, that I'm asking you, the court, to invalidate the law, even if it doesn't uh, affect me whatsoever. That's simply not part of our, or should not be, it has been uh, at some level for many years now, but it should not be a part of our judicial process, but it is. And Justice Thomas, and thankfully a, uh, a reminder uh, of why that's so, why cases should not start in any way whatsoever other than two parties have a case in controversy. Uh, let me check my notes and my tabs here. Here we go. From Justice Thomas's uh, concurrence opinion, uh, uh, the judicial power is only the authority to resolve private disputes between particular parties rather than matters affecting the general public. He goes on, and um, why is that so? Why should courts only adjudicate the case in front of them. And that's, as we all as Federalists would agree, I would like to think that judges don't have any particularized knowledge of anything else. They should not be deemed to have specialized knowledge and they shouldn't be uh, put in a position where they're making policy. And Justice Thomas's main point that he hammers home in this opinion is if you allow the overbreath doctrine to continue, it simply allows federal courts to make policy, whether it's good policy, bad policy, whether it overturns the legislative policy or the executive policy, it, we should not be allowing federal courts to make policy. And that's what the overbreath doctrine does. And he wants to get rid of it. I couldn't agree more. Now, the problem is no one concur, no one joined in his concurrence. So is he an, the outlier on this particular issue? It would seem to be that's the case. I'm hoping not. We shall see. Uh, but I do not think that any court, but especially the Ninth Circuit, which has a, obviously a long history of getting slapped bound by the circuit or by the Supreme Court for just making things up uh, that aren't in the case that's in front of them. We shouldn't be allowing them even greater latitude by continuing to have the overbreath doctrine be applicable to anything whatsoever. Let's get rid of it. Now, the, let's get to the dissent. As I said, uh, Justice Jackson authors the dissent, Sotomayor joins her in that. And what it comes down to is, is again, the battle of the dictionaries. The dissent would have us use the common language definitions for uh, entice, encourage and induce that's where the tension between the majority and the dissent comes into play. What definitions are we going to apply to these words? Are they terms of art or should we use the common everyday definition? Obviously, uh, their uh, co common usage uh, idea did not win out. I was expecting a six to three decision. Even Justice Kagan, who uh, isn't always, how shall we say, uh, the, the, well, let's put it this way. I was expecting Justice Kagan to dissent as well. She did not. She joined the majority opinion 
and basically uh, with their understanding, I went back through my notes that these kinds of cases should not be dealt with in an overbreadth doctrine. Those that would be an extreme use of overbreadth, which you would simply say is use an as applied uh, standard on a case by case basis. Looking through my notes of the oral arguments back in uh, uh, March, but I was expecting her to go with uh, the dissent on their definitional aspect of this case. And that 1324 did in fact uh, become overly broad when Congress uh, deleted some of the words in the prior uh, iteration of the statute. But that didn't happen. She was the seventh vote for the majority. So the dissent goes on uh, listing the potential litany of horrors as uh, it was deemed by the majority. Uh, we could, the government could prosecute a grandmother for saying, telling her grandson that he should stay in the United States in violation of the law. Or it would uh, prohibit a immigration attorney from uh, discussing a case with his or her client because that could be deemed to be encouraging someone to stay in the country illegally if they had a route uh, to gain lawful status. Or could a doctor be prosecuted because they encourage someone to stay for surgery, again, staying in violation of the law. That litany of horrors, as it was deemed, is uh, was, was pretty much brushed away by the majority as uh, not something that was uh, thought of or as a possible, none of these things were deemed possible uh, in that there was 70 years of this particular statute in its current iteration. And in no time whatsoever has any of these kinds of things even been brought up uh, as a criminal case. There was uh, no reason to believe that they would ever would be. And it, the majority simply brushes uh, this, these kinds of arguments away. Uh, the dissent says that the majority was rewriting the statute and writing back into the statute those terms that had been uh, removed in the 50s. Uh, I don't see it. I, I, I agree with if that you're going to use the terms encourage and induce, uh, they are terms of art and encourage and induce do mean solicit and facilitate. There is all of that old soil as has been discussed previously that comes with those terms. And therefore there is a mens rea built into 1324. You didn't need extraneous terms. So the best part of the dissent, and I'll finish here, was something that we, again, as Federalists should appreciate. The dissent starts with, ordinarily, we start with the text of the statute. Wow, what, what a great novel idea that in case after case after case after case, doesn't always hold true. But in Hansen, they became textualists and they wanna argue the text of the statute. The only difference is which definitions of the, the words of the text do they want to go with. But at least we are now at the place where everybody is arguing text of the statute. And I think that's a good place to be. So with that, I'll turn it back to Kayla. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that uh, sort of breakdown of the opinions as they are put forward, the various arguments. I actually already answered one of the questions I have, which was what was the sort of statutory interpretation framework that's used, but textualism across the board and arguing about definitions. Um, it's now time for audience Q&A. We have one, but I'm going to remind our audience, if you would like to submit questions, please feel free to do so. Um, we're excited to get them answered. Our first question does come from an audience member who asks, 
Uh, do you think Hanson will have any impact on the abstract advocacy doctrine described by Justice Scalia in Williams? I believe he offered a statement. I encourage you to obtain child pornography as an example of a protected abstract advocacy. Uh, Justice Barrett's opinion doesn't seem to address this doctrine, but Justice Jackson raised it in her assent. And I agree. Uh, Justice Barrett ignores that issue completely. Uh, there was one other issue that uh, the, the dissent pointed out that Justice Barrett and her decision uh, did not even address. And that was in most of these uh, kinds of cases where you use the terms uh, encourage and induce, you're encouraging a criminal violation in most, but not all, civil, excuse me, immigration uh, cases, they are prosecuted by the civil authorities uh, from ICE and the Department of Justice Executive Office for Immigration Review. In other words, immigration cases are civil cases. So can uh, we encourage a civil violation and does that somehow affect the overbreadth doctrine. As the dissent points out, uh, Justice Barrett does not address that issue. So they sort of hung it there as low hanging fruit. Maybe someone will give that a try. Uh, if we're simply encouraging a civil violation of say, entering without inspection, uh, will, that some, will that be uh, dealt with by the court in a different fashion than uh, Hanson uh, and uh, uh, Sinai Smith with their fraud schemes? Would we they deal with it differently? Possibly, we'll see, uh, but based on today's decision, I don't think that that's gonna happen. I think they will, uh, the courts will look at this, look at what happened to the ninth now twice uh, and say, no, I think 1324 is just fine the way it is, and you're guilty. But it, it's at least out there. It's, there's a possibility. Got it. Well, next question for you. You mentioned uh, that you expected this to be a 6-3 decision. Uh, were there any other things that surprised you about how the decision came down, uh, either the way it was decided, how the court broke out, or the rationale of any of the justices? No, it, it, well, Thomas's uh, concurrence scared me. When when I first got the decision, I saw that it was uh, uh, two in the um, dissent, but there was only six uh, in the majority. I'm like, oh no! Did Thomas? What what, what did he do? Did he did he go completely in a different direction? And so I was relieved when I got to his concurring opinion and. You know, read it, you know, you should always hold with, as we all know, we should withhold judgment until we actually know what we're talking about. And so I did, and I'm like, okay, I understand completely. He wants to get rid of the overbreath doctrine. So I was relieved about that. Um, I was scared when I saw it, the, the fact that he had a concurring opinion, if there was something truly uh, an outlier that he wanted to discuss. And thankfully it wasn't. I was Disappointed, as I just said, to answer the last question, that uh, Justice Barrett didn't take up the uh, in violation of the law kind of aspect. Does it have to be uh, an encouragement or inducement of a criminal violation, or can someone be convicted of 1324 because they are encouraging or inducing a civil viol civil, civil immigration violation? That's still out there. I wish uh, Justice Barrett had added one more line. Literally, that would have been a it in her decision uh, addressing that aspect because that was uh, a big chunk of a couple of the uh, Amici briefs were making that point. Uh, so it's, it is still out there. That was a bit of a disappointment. But other than that, it came, it, the decisions came out exactly, pretty much exactly how I thought they would in terms of the language used. It really comes down to, we're fighting about which definition we're going to use. Are we going to be using 
a the term of art that is a, a criminal law context, or are we just going to use Webster's? And that's what it comes came down to. Uh, thankfully, there wasn't anything more than that that I could uh, glean from today's decision. Got it. Uh, following up on that dis distinction between which dictionary, um, are, are there other cases where that the, the way this decision came out and the dictionary that was used by the majority could have an effect? Or do we not know sort of what this framework and the dictionary that was chosen, how that will affect other cases? Well, I think that's where the, that term old soil that I, I brought up a couple of times. And again, it's that term uh, is throughout all three opinions. I think that is the best way to analyze a criminal law statute is look at the history of the words in criminal law and not simply the common everyday definition because we as lawyers understand that, that sometimes there's literally hundreds of years of history that, that attached it, uh, itself to words in a criminal law context, especially when you know some of our uh, laws and cases start citing uh, cases from merry old England in the 16 and 1700s. So you bring all of that forward to today. Should we just be using common definitions? Well, I think we're well past that. And I, I guess that's part of the rub from the dissent's point of view. Why shouldn't we be using the Webster's Dictionary? Because uh, that's what everybody else uses, not just us uh, lawyers. That's a legit argument. But I think that horse is so far out of the barn, down the road it is three counties over. No. Terms have meaning and you have to look at the criminal law context for the meaning when you have a common law uh, system such as us, where we base it on literally hundreds of years of talking and writing. And when you got to bring all of that forward, and that's the old soil that comes with it. Well, thank you. Uh, another question from our audience. Uh, they asked something of a broader on Justice Thomas's sort of jurisprudence. Um, the questioner asks, Justice Thomas has struck out on his own a number of issues, digital media providers as common carriers, the continued vitality of New York versus Sullivan, uh, and now Hansen. Will the Academy or media re-examine his scholarship as a result of these concurring opinions? I can only hope so. I mean, for many years, Justice Thomas was seen as, to, in, in an insulting way, Scalia's sidekick. And I think what we've been seeing now for the past several years is that not only was wrong then, it's certainly wrong now. He has his own opinions, his own ideas. Obviously we can agree or disagree with them, but they are, he's well versed in the, the historical context of the constitution uh, as is illustrated by his uh, concurrent opinion today. He's talking about uh, the New York uh, uh, state law and how those uh, laws were either upheld or dismissed by the super legislative body that existed in 1777. He brings all of that forward, all of that history. And I think uh, we're finally now able to appreciate at least some other folks who aren't, haven't been listening to him and reading what he's been saying for the last 30, 40 years. Other folks are now beginning to understand the gravity of what he discusses and how he wants the judiciary to actually do their job and not do the job of the policymakers. Obviously, that's his number one priority is we need to be focused on doing the judicial work and not the legislative work. So I'm hoping that uh, that is coming out there, whether the mainstream media uh, cares or will discuss it or not, or if they do, uh, 
just dismiss him, which is what I perceive will be happening. That's a, a, that's a different issue. I also think that one of the good things of COVID was we actually got to hear Justice Thomas. Uh, for years, he wouldn't say a word in oral arguments, and he always made the point that I want to hear what the lawyers say. This is their time to shine. This is their time to argue to me their position. I didn't want to waste their time. But then with COVID, we got to hear everybody ask their questions. We got to hear what Justice Thomas was focusing in on. I think that was maybe, maybe the only good thing about the COVID situation, but it was a good thing. And so now I think because of that, we are uh, appreciating Justice Thomas even more than we had before. Nice to said, thank you. Uh, another audience question, reverting back to uh, your comments on old soil. Um, what if there isn't any old soil? Does Hansen create a presumption in favor of inferring specialized meaning or using dictionary definitions? Now, that's a good question. Thankfully though, is in most uh, cases there is old soil. But yes, uh, as Congress continues to write new laws, some of which have no basis in anything uh, of yesterday, I do believe that if there's no old soil to attach, then yes, until something can be attached to uh, a word that hadn't been in the criminal law context previously, we should be using the common definitions until something begins to attach itself to those words and phrases. That's what begins the old soil process. Old things uh, get into the soil, they attach themselves there, they, the soil uh, gets uh, used by the plant and up it shoots with a little bit of water and some sunlight. So until the soil, the water, the sun attach themselves to definitions, if it's a brand new uh, phrase or a brand new word that's being introduced into the criminal law lexicon, I think, yeah, what does Webster say? Because we have nothing else to start from. So we have to start from somewhere. Why not? Why not the common definition? Fair enough. Need a starting point, I guess. Um, if you don't yes. have soil, then, then you got to go somewhere. Um, next question for you. Obviously, when we did the uh, courthouse steps right after the oral argument, uh, the questions all revolved around what, what's the court going to decide? What are the uh, sort of arguments that are going to be made? Now that we have the decision, what are the questions that remain unanswered, if any? Well, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, whether a civil law violation is enough to encourage and induce uh, when the, the terminology is a violation of law. Does it have to be a violation of criminal law? If not, then Hansen or Senator Smith goes back to having a legitimate argument on that basis. Look, we are encouraging a civil immigration violation, someone crossing the border illegally or staying uh, illegally. That in and of itself, uh, at least coming uh, legally and then overstaying is not a criminal law violation. Coming across the border without proper documentation is in fact a criminal law violation. It's uh, normally not done so. It's normally handled by civil immigration uh, courts, but it could be. So there, that, that play, that issue is still out there. Well, it remains to be seen how uh, some courts would uh, handle that. Like I said earlier, I think now that there's been two 1324 decisions, my assumption is the courts will be, no, we're not, we're not going there. Does, is there, are there any other issues? Yes, as, as just discussed, if there's a new, uh, not maybe not so much in the 1324 case, but again, new uh, criminal law violations that don't have the old soil. Uh, as I sit here, I start thinking about technological issues and new crimes that are being created, if you will, uh, based on uh, stealing uh, 
IT stuff and a lot of the ways you go about making those steps are new. And so there's not the old definitions might not apply. They uh, might have to uh, generate new terms. And so those kinds of issues outside 1324 will continue to develop as technology develops. Uh, as to a, a th more 1324 decisions, I don't, I don't see anything more than what we've been seeing in the last few years with uh, 1324 A1, A4 uh, prosecutions, which was uh, this case. It's going to be those kinds of multi-victim, multi-million dollar fraud schemes, the one-offs where someone gives, you know, their nephew $500 to go from Tijuana to San Diego. Yeah, it could be prosecuted. Will it be? Unlikely. Would it become a Supreme Court case? Highly unlikely, simply because of the way uh, this, you know, U.S. Attorney's Office is, especially at the border, are overworked, undermanned. They're not going to be taking those one-off kinds of cases. They're going to be taking $2 million fraud schemes like this. So I don't see any great change in how the government is going to be prosecuting 1324s going forward. Got it. Well, thank you. And uh, barring any final questions from our audience or any final thoughts on your end, uh, I, we can wrap it there and give everybody back a little bit of their afternoons. On behalf of the Federalist Society and myself, Mr. Fish, thanks so much for joining us today and sharing your valuable time and expertise. Thank you to our audience as well uh, for joining and participating. We welcome listener feedback at info at fed-soc.org. As in always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about other upcoming virtual events. With that, thank you all for joining us today. We're adjourned. Mm -hmm.